Well, welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many people uh, here. My name is Henk de Berg. I'm the head of the Department of Germanic Studies and also uh, the, uh, one of the two directors together with Zanja Dubrenko of the snappily titled Prokhorov Center for the Study of Central and Eastern European Intellectual and Cultural History. I'll also be your master of ceremonies for the next 30 minutes or so. A special welcome, of course, to our uh, distinguished guest, Dr. Irina Pokorova, who uh, a little later on will be opening, officially opening the Pokorov Center. Irina, welcome to Sheffield. Uh, it's great to have you here. Now, um, Zenia Dubenko may have mentioned uh, this uh, this morning. We are here to celebrate a number of things. Uh, 100 years of Russian formalism, which is, of course, why we are having this conference, 50 years of teaching and research in Russian and Slavonic studies at the University of Sheffield, then the opening of the Prokhorov Center, uh, and uh, last but not least, the end of the academic year, or at least the end of the teaching period at the University of Sheffield. Nothing wrong with teaching, of course, but we all know uh, that it can be pretty hard work. Now, the next 30 minutes or so will be devoted to two of the things that I've just mentioned. 50 years of Russian and Slavonic studies at the University of Sheffield, uh, and then the opening of the uh, Prokhorov Center. We'll start with uh, the Russian department, and for that I want to hand over to my former colleague, Bill Lederbarrow, Professor Emeritus of Russian at the University of Sheffield, who has very kindly agreed to say a few words about the Department of Russian and Slavonic Studies. So, Bill, over to you. Right, thank you very much, Hank. Uh, relax, it will be just a few words as well. Um, I, although I retired from the Department of Russian and Slavonic Studies in um, 2007, um, it's been an important part of my life for 45 of those, of those 50 years that we're, we're celebrating this year. It's also been, I think, important in the lives of so many of the students, undergraduate and graduate, who have passed through the Department of Russian and Slavonic Studies since its, its, its foundation. Now, it is true also that 2015 marks uh, an anniversary, a 50th anniversary of the uh, of, of, of the, the establishment of the department in 1965, but the department had a sort of pre-existence, albeit tenuous and short-lived. Uh, there was a previous department of Russian in the University of Sheffield in the 1910s. Um, I think it was just one man and a dog, as opposed to the four men and a dog that we had for, you know, after, after 1965. Um, but that department disappeared in the in the 1930s. But there was, say, there was a, a previous incarnation. But it's true to say that the, the modern department began in, in 1965 with the arrival of a man called Alan Waring. And he has to take, I think, much of the credit for the, the establishment of that department, for setting its tone, uh, for making key appointments, um, and for laying down the, you know, the kind of things that were taught, particularly the, the other Slavonic languages that became part of the uh, the teaching diet of that department. Alan was um, a senior lecturer in charge of the department from 1965 until his own retirement in, in 1993, and I think it's very important that we bear him in mind. Now, those, and there may be one or two here who remember Alan, but I think it would be true to say that he was what you might call a hands-off leader. Um, and in some respects that was a bad thing, but we won't go into that. But, but in other ways it was quite, it was quite liberating, it was quite positive. Uh, it gave staff a free hand to develop and to do what they, what they wanted. For example, when, when I arrived as a, as a young, naive, 22-year-old in 1970, um, I was given one week's notice by Alan to the effect that I was going to be teaching a course on Russian intellectual history, which I never taught before. Well, let's be honest, which I've never actually studied before, and about which I knew uh, nothing at all. And so, as a result of that, for the first year of that course, I managed with some difficulty to keep ooh, a week, about a week ahead of the students for, for the duration of that year. But the point I'm trying to make is that it, it was a positive thing, it was immensely character building, um, and I, 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 I reckon that by the time I retired in 2007, I was probably nearly two weeks ahead of the students. So it had a positive effect on, on my life. 
Now, Alan made some very, very fine appointments to what became a very happy uh, department. And I, for one, shall be always grateful, I think, for the tremendous friendships I enjoyed in the Department of Russian Symbolic Studies, for the unfailing support of colleagues, and also for the, the kind of intellectual environment that they, they provided. It really was the, and I hope still is, the happiest of, of departments. However, it was not always easy. Um, Russian departments in, in this country, as, as throughout the world, tend to be small, and small tends to be well, beautiful, yes, but vulnerable as well in times of, of, of economic crisis. And there were times when it looked like the, the Russian department at Sheffield was facing its end. Um, for example, in the, the 1980s, there was a government review uh, of the provision uh, of Russian in this, in this country. And several Russian departments in various British universities, including Sheffield, were recommended by this review for, for closure. The criterion appeared to be the lack of a professorial head of department. We didn't have a professor here. Even though I think all of the departments that were nominated for closure, they were amongst the strongest research departments in, in the country. The, the inquiry was advised by um, a well-known Tolstoyan scholar whose name may well still be familiar to people in this room today, uh, Professor Reg Christian up in St Andrews. Now, Reg Christian was a, was a decent man. And I can't believe that he would have approved the recommended closures uh, in that report. But if he did, then it would have been the only example in history, I think, of the lions being thrown to the Christian. So. <laughs> now, we, we survived then um, simply because of the boldness of the man who was then Vice-Chancellor, uh, Geoffrey Sims. And he simply refused to implement the recommendation for, for closure. And that set a pattern that's been followed ever since, I think, in Sheffield, of tremendous support for Russia from, from our bosses, from, from the Vice-Chancellors, and often imaginative support. Um, for example, in the, the 1990s, Sir Gareth Roberts uh, finally addressed the problem of the lack of a professorial head in Russian studies by creating not one chair of Russian, but three chairs of Russian in one, in one fell swoop. And I'm quite sure, he says, looking at Penny Simons here from the French department, that that must have caused some mutterings amongst our colleagues in the other modern languages departments. But I think, it, I think it paid off because Russian gradually rose, or very quickly rose, to become one of the strongest research and teaching departments in, in, in this country. Indeed, for more than 10 years, the, the Sheffield Russian department uh, topped the, the Times lead tables for that subject for, for, for Russia. So I think we probably paid back the, the, the trust that was put in us by uh, the Vice-Chancellor. Um, the appointment of David Shepherd, who I see at the back here, um, he's got a look on his face which he obviously thinks I'm going to say put, put an end to all that, but it didn't. <laughs> the appointment of David Shepherd uh, during those years um, brought not only new blood to the department because you know, we really hadn't changed very much since um, the, the, the 1960s. But it also helped to steer its development in a, in a new uh, direction alongside the directions that we'd already been following. And that direction was, of course, um, cultural theory. And this led uh, to the creation of the Bakhtin Centre here, which David headed up for, for, for many years, and which Craig Brandis now, now runs. And I think that centre, in turn, has clearly helped to provide part of the basis um, the intellectual basis on which the, the Prokhorov Centre is now constructed and indeed the, the, the present conference is, is, is taking place. Okay, so what well, time passes, things change, um, new faces displace the, the old ones and I retired just as uh, Eugenia Davrenka came here, don't take it personally Eugenia, it was not <laughs> it was just, just an accident, an accident of history, that was all. But, uh, but as, as a figure from the, the department's past, I'd, I'd like to invite you this evening to join me in wishing Russian and Slavonic studies here in Sheffield all the best for the future and here's the next 50 years. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, for those very stimulating uh, words. Now, let's uh, now move on to the second, and uh, you'll probably be glad to hear, also last part uh, of uh, these 30 minutes, which is the official opening of the Prokhorov Centre. Um, 
the Pockroft Centre is the only research centre in the UK which has an integrated focus on both Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, we, Senior de Banker and I and, and the other members uh, of the centre think that it makes a lot of sense to have a centre which focuses on the histories of both Central and Eastern Europe for the simple reason that those histories have been intertwined for centuries in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for example, um, or in the creation, development and eventual demise of the GDR. Looking at things from the perspective of my own research specialism, um, German or German language intellectual history, um, there are also very clear connections. Emmanuel Kant was born in Kaliningrad, Arthur Schopenhauer was born in Gdansk, um, and um, and Sigmund Freud was born in Przybor in what is now the Czech Republic. And there have been, uh, right up till, till this day, uh, many, many such instances of um, intellectual, artistic, literary, social and uh, political uh, cross-fertilization, cooperation, collaboration, at times, of course, also uh, conflict. And, it is the aim of the Prokhorov Center to study all these interconnections from a scholarly perspective. So, um, this is the reason that the Prokhorov Center was founded in 2014, and in this endeavor, we are supported, generously supported, by the Prokhorov Foundation, which is led by Dr. Irina Prokhorova. Now, before I hand over to her for the official opening of the Prokhorov Center, I just want to say a few words, if I may, about uh, Irina. Um, and I realize that this puts me in a, uh, a difficult position for two reasons. First of all, because I, um, and hence Irina, because we are standing between you and your dinner. So I don't want to make things too long. Um, but secondly, also, uh, because int introducing such a distinguished uh, guest is, is, is always a real challenge. I can uh, remember a conference, an international conference, not too long ago, where someone, one of my colleagues, a female colleague, uh, introduced the well-known Canadian psychologist Keith Oatley. Uh, Keith Oatley was, or is not only a psychologist, but also uh, a novelist, who's written, um, his, most, his, his best known work is a novel about how Sherlock Holmes goes to Vienna to be treated by Sigmund Freud because um, Sherlock Holmes wants to get rid of his drug addiction and addiction, and then he goes to uh, he goes to Vienna. The novel uh, is called *The Case of Emily V*, um, and you can you recognise the, uh, the the sort of the pattern there. Freud has various stories about or case studies uh, of of his patients. Uh, where he uses similar sort of pseudonyms. Uh, so the founding patient of psychoanalysis was Bertha Pappenheim, but in order to preserve her anonymity, uh, Freud used uh, the name Anna O, Anna O. Dot, and the various other patients uh, like, uh, like that, such as Emmy von N, Emmy von N and N. Dot. Uh, and this colleague of mine then introduced the famous psychologist Keith Oatley, praising not only his academic work, but also this novel that she had read with great pleasure and that she recommended to everyone, the case of Emily V. Um, so uh, you can see how easily things can go wrong uh, when introducing someone genuinely uh, uh, important. So, not a novelist. There are still many things I can get wrong, so in order to reduce the risk of doing that, uh, I will uh, be relatively brief. Uh, and um, just focus on um, um, your work as a cultural historian and literary critic, editor uh, and uh, publisher. You graduated from Moscow State University, I think, with a PhD on English literary modernism. Um, and uh, in, 1920, uh, sorry, in 1992 found a new, a new literary observer uh, which is the first, was the first independent, genuinely independent Russian uh, academic uh, journal, and I'm sure 
all of you here are familiar with that uh, particular uh, journal. And this was then followed by uh, two other uh, journals, NZ, the Basel on Politics and Culture, and also uh, the journal uh, Fashion Theory, which is the first, um, uh, the first academic journal in Russia which uh, takes fashion seriously as a cultural, uh, as a cultural uh, phenomenon. Irina also founded the New Literary Observer Publishing uh, House, uh, which I'm sure all of you know uh, as well, and is the recipient of uh, a very large number of uh, awards, of which I want to highlight only the two French ones, uh, French, uh, ones the Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres, uh, and also uh, the uh, Légion of Donneur. And I'm Yvonne Sheffield, and we're very, very grateful for the fact that you uh, are supporting us and the Centre so generous, uh, generously, uh, and that you're here. And with that, I would like to hand over to you for the official opening of the Prokhorov Centre. Irina, the floor is yours. <laughs> Search and creating new paradigms uh, of revelating our history. Uh, you know, uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, the Prokhorov Center and the organizers still uh, consider Russia to be part of Europe. Nowadays, it's not very trendy in Russia usually, but still we believe that it is that Russia is part of European culture and uh, contributing quite a lot to it, in spite of some bad guys who try to spoil the picture. <laughs> uh, and as a publishing editor and the founder of the journals, dealing with different academic uh, trends, I can testify that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, Central East European intellectuals uh, produced quite a lot of, of unique and interesting uh, studies and I think this dramatic experience uh, of their totalitarian past uh, gave them the possibility to revelate the, the, the very paradigms how to deal with human history. And I do hope that the center will be at the very center of this 
multidisciplinary studies and truly uniting uh, Central and East Europeans with the whole world. <laughs> and thank you very much and let's go forward. Thank you very much.